Hello, cybersecurity and national security class, and welcome to class two, the online portion of class two in our module on cybersecurity and national security. In this lecture, we will talk about national security law in the United States, and in particular, we'll look at the United States Constitution's provision for war powers. Uh, we will talk a bit about the separation of powers doctrine. Uh, we'll look at the War Powers Act and some of its specific provisions and limitations, and we will look at some case law that relates to the War Powers Act. Along the way, we'll make some comparisons between all this and our concepts of cyberspace and internet governance and the idea of, uh, of war or conflict in cyberspace. But we'll save a lot of that discussion for when we meet together in class. So if you remember in class last week, we began to talk about the uh, constitutional framework of the separation of, of powers. And we talked uh, about some deep historical background going back all the way to the Thirty Years' War and the rise of the nation state. And then we talked about the concept of separation of powers. And we talked a bit about the U.S. historical context that leads to um, the, er the framers' early concerns about control over the military and about the separation of powers. So let's spend a little bit of time looking at some specific uh, text in the Constitution. And the first piece that we look at here is uh, Article 1. And Article 1, of course, lays out the legislative power. Article 2 lays out the executive power. Article 3 lays out the judicial power. And there we have our separation of powers. So within Article 1, Section 8 are the enumerated powers of Congress. So within Section 8, among those enumerated powers is the power to declare war. So Congress, according to the constitutional separation of powers, is the body that has the power to declare war. Um, notice also these other uh, military-related items, letters of marquee and reprisal. These probably relate originally to uh, piracy on the high seas. Uh, and making rules concerning the capture of vessels on land and water. Then, uh, another enumerated power that Congress has is to raise and support armies. Um, notice that there is a limit on the congressional appropriation that can be used to raise and support an army. Congress also has the power to uh, provide and maintain a navy. And Congress has the power to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. So the ability to declare war, uh, the ability to make appropriations to raise and support a navy and an army, uh, and the ability to make rules and regulations governing, governing the army and the navy falls within the legislative branch to Congress. Congress also has a number of other powers relating to the conduct of the armed forces. So we spoke a little bit uh, in class last week about the Calling Forth Act, one, an early congressional act that had to do with the relationship of, of a national standing army and the militias. So notice here in the Article One of the Constitution, Congress has the authority to call forth the militia if it's necessary to ex execute the laws of the Union, suppress an insurrection, or repel, repel an invasion. So the Calling Forth Act was actually... Um, issued, promulgated, pursuant to this provision. Um, to provide for the organizing, arming, disciplining of the uh, militia and governing the militia to the extent that it's uh, employed in the service of the United States. Um, and then, kind of at the end of all of the enumerated powers, and there are a number of other enumerated powers in Article One, Section 8, of course, that don't um, directly address war power or the armies or militia, uh, it indicates that it's sort of a catch-all that Congress has the authority to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper to carry into execution all of the other foregoing powers. One important limitation on Congress in Article One relating to uh, the war powers and separation of powers is the restriction on uh, suspending the writ of habeas corpus. Uh, this has become an important issue, of course, uh, today in the war on terror and the question of uh, the legality of detaining terror suspects indefinitely at, Guant uh, at Guantanamo Bay. Uh, 
Um, but notice the language here, the privilege of writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. So um, the limitation on the power to suspend the writ is not absolute. It's qualified by uh, a necessity requirement. Article 1, Section 10 contains an interesting limitation on the states with respect to war-related activities and making war. So it states that no state shall, without the consent of Congress, keep troops or ships of war in a time of peace or engage in war. Now, I think that probably that latter part, a state shall not engage in war, is uh, pretty intuitive, maybe assumed by us today, that a sta an individual state, like Texas, say, wouldn't go to war with a foreign power on its own. Uh, that wasn't obviously necessarily entirely clear at the time of the founding. But do notice that there is a, a really fascinating qualification in this uh, clause because in this section because it indicates that a state can go to war if it is actually invaded or is in imminent danger uh, in such a way that it will not admit of a delay. In other words, a state is in, has been invaded or is about to be invaded. Um, the state can respond, at least according to this section, uh, on its own with military force. So now we move into Article 2, the executive power, and Article 2, Section 2 gives uh, a provision that I think most of us are probably familiar with, which is that the president is commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Notice also that the president is the commander-in-chief of the militia of the several states, and notice this qualification when called into the actual service of the United States. Article 2, Section 3 is a general provision about the executive, not limited to war powers, but it indicates that the executive is responsible to take care that the laws of the United States be faithfully executed, and also indicates that the president will commission any officers of the United States. Then Article 3, we move into the judicial power. So Section 2 of Article 3 contains... Again, the familiar uh, statement and limitation that uh, the judicial, what, what the scope of the judicial power is. So the judicial power extends to any cases in law and equity uh, arising under the Constitution, the laws of the United States, treaties, and a variety of other cases in which there is some kind of justiciable um, controversy. Notice that this clause doesn't indicate that the judiciary has any authority specifically to adjudicate the question of whether the United States should go to war. So there is one place in which the Constitution does give the judiciary some specific responsibilities with respect to things that can be considered related to the war powers, and that is uh, trying cases involving treason. So those cases have to be adjudicated judicially, but we can see that there doesn't seem to be any other circumstance in which a war powers issue is adjudicated by the judiciary. Now, of course, the uh, we know now through a history of constitutional law and adjudication that um, the judiciary is seen to be ha to seen to have the power of judicial review. So it could be that the judiciary could look at a specific uh, congressional enactment and decide whether it is consistent with the uh, separation of powers or not. And in fact, the Supreme Court has, uh, the federal courts have done that on numerous occasions. But it, the Constitution doesn't give the judiciary any role in adjudicating whether the United States should go to war or how the United States is prosecuting wars uh, or things along those lines. So, you know, think about a few ambiguities in the constitutional text itself. What is war? Uh, does, does war, does the war powers include small-scale actions that might involve the military? Does it include emergency actions that might involve the military? It's not, it's not entirely clear what war means under the Constitution. What does it mean to declare a war? Uh, for Congress to declare a war, does it mean to recognize that some existing actions undertaken by the legislature are war? Uh, 
or does it mean to actually initiate war? How can the military be used, if at all, short of creating a state of war? Uh, can the mi uh, military be flown in to a crisis area to secure order while medical supplies are being distributed? Not specified in the war powers provision of the Constitution. Can Congress use its appropriation power to limit the executive power over the armed forces? For example, by putting a condition in an appropriations bill that says we only will give this appropriation if the president commits our forces in X way or doesn't commit our forces in X way. Well, some of these questions were attempted to be answered through the War Powers Resolution. So let's talk a little bit about um, that resolution, what it says, and what's, what some of its limits are. And as we'll see when we look at some case law, very likely in its current form, it, it, if actually applied, it would be held to be unconstitutional. So the War Powers Resolution was adopted in response to the Vietnam War, and there were obviously uh, a lot of issues, public issues, with respect to how the Vietnam War was was prosecuted and why it was being prosecuted. There were a lot of issues involving um, secrecy and potential abuses of executive authority. So uh, Congress adopts the War Powers Resolution in response to that. Note that Congress adopts the War Powers Resolution over President Nixon's veto. So President Nixon uh, vetoes, issues a veto statement saying that he believes uh, that the War Powers Resolution is unconstitutional because it gives Congress too much authority over the executive function um, with respect to the war power, but Congress overrides that veto. And, you know, the purpose of it, as you read it, is to seek the president, uh, is to seek to prevent the president alone or the president and Congress acting together from instituting war covertly or, or by mistake, inadvertently, by some kind of escalation of, of hostility. The key provisions of the War Powers Act, as you read through it, you can see Section 2, the, the, the statement of policy really suggests that it's intending to implement and to put kind of a framework around the constitutional uh, war powers provisions. And the way it tries to do that is through a process of, of consultation, reporting, and then response by Congress. So consultation requirement says that if the uh, if hostilities are imminent, the president has to consult with Congress about that. The reporting requirement says that within 48 hours of when troops are introduced into hostilities, the president needs to give a report to Congress. And you can see uh, some language about uh, what that means in the statute. And then a really key piece of it is that at least once every six months, the president has to continue to report to Congress about the um, status and the ongoing status of those hostilities. So now as this reporting is being done to Congress, then Congress has uh, some powers under the statute to act or not act. So um, within 60 days after a report is submitted pursuant to the statute, that's a, that's a trigger pursuant to the statute, the president is required to terminate that military action unless Congress either has formally declared war or issued a specific authorization for the use of, of force or Congress has acted to extend the 60-day period or Congress is physically unable to meet because of the war, because Congress is, is under threat. So notice that this gives Congress an ability to um, act in response to what the president has done and effectively gives Congress what's called a legislative veto over what the president has done with respect to committing those troops. And that is a really controversial piece of the War Powers Resolution. In fact, I gave you some material to read from the National War Powers Commission, which you can see is... Um, led by some very influential and, and powerful uh, people in the national security field. That report notes that the War Powers Resolution has been widely criticized as possibly unconstitutional uh, because of the way it gives Congress this legislative veto. And, and this is important, I want you to notice this, 
no president in 35 years has ever filed a report pursuant to those triggering provisions. Now, we all know over the past 35 years that the U.S. has been involved in numerous military actions, including things that we call a war. I mean, we call it the Gulf War. Um, so how has this been gotten around? Well, presidents have issued reports to Congress, but they have indicated that the reports are consistent with the War Powers Resolution in significant part in an effort to try to not trigger it by saying that they're issuing the report pursuant to the War Powers Resolution. The National uh, War Powers Commission report also propo proposes an alternate framework. I don't necessarily need you to know what that framework is, but just be aware that there are other ideas floating around for how you could have some accountability between the executive and, and Congress without having the possible pro constitutional problem of the legislative veto. So how do we get to those constitutional problems? And this is where the INSV Chada case uh, first comes in. So if you're looking, you read through this case, you see it's an immigration case. It's not a war powers case, but it does have very important implications for the War Powers Act. As you read through that case, you'll see it's an immigration statute. And what the statute did was it allowed the attorney general to suspend a deportation order for, for various reasons. But it'll, it, it provided a check on that suspension of a deportation order by the Attorney General by allowing either the House or the Senate uh, effectively to veto the Attorney General's decision. So factually, we have this individual, Chada. Chada overstays his, his visa. He's deported. Uh, he goes to the, through this process with the Attorney General's office, and he, uh, the Attorney General believes that he satisfies all the criteria. The Attorney General... Um, suspends the deportation order, which would allow Chada to remain in the country. But Chada, along with some other individuals, this comes to the attention of some members of Congress. They introduce a resolution to uh, veto the attorney general's decision. And, you know, if you look at some of the procedural history, you'll see that it wasn't sort of hotly debated or anything like that. Very unlikely that many members paid much attention to it, but Congress approves this resolution, which has the legal effect under the statute um, of annulling the attorney general's suspension of the deportation order. So it, effectively, it means Chada will be deported. Chada goes to court, challenges uh, the constitutionality of the statute, and it goes up to the Supreme Court. So the issue before the Supreme Court is, does this congressional veto provision violate the constitutional separation of powers? And the majority opinion says, yes, it does. It violates the constitutional separation of powers. Now, a key issue kind of threading through this question is the existence of the modern administrative state. So we know we have a uh, legislature, an executive, and a judiciary. Those are the three branches mentioned in the Constitution. But we know because of the size and the complexity of the modern administrative state that we have a vast uh, administrative agency apparatus and a great deal of that is within the executive branch so how does that work it, well the way it usually works is congress adopts a statute that broadly uh, sets up a regulatory scheme in a certain area and then delegates to usually an executive branch regulatory agency the authority to issue regulations and to administer those regulations consistent with the statute why do we do that? A number of reasons. I mean, think of something like the uh, Federal Food and Drug Administration, the FDA. The FDA is a creature of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. The Congress, you know, enacts this statute that has to do with various things, including food and drug safety. But you don't want a committee of Congress deciding whether a particular pharmaceutical product is safe and effective for medical use. You want a body of experts making that decision. So Congress delegates to the FDA the ability to set up a mechanism where experts can actually look at that. Uh, if you take administrative law, you know there's a, lots and lots of issues that float around in there and the extent to which an administrative agency is or is not acting consistent with the statute is, is, a, is an issue that often gets litigated. So there is this sense in which there's an issue of convenience or an issue of simply administrability 
that allows Congress to delegate these functions to administrative agencies. And in fact, Supreme Court precedent prior to Chadha uh, had indicated that Congress has a very broad ability to delegate to executive agencies, and that remains the law. But the majority in Chadha says that is not enough to override a real problem with separation of powers. And in particular, the majority has two problems here. One is with the presentment clauses, and the other is with the bicameralism requirement. So the presentment clauses are uh, in a, a number of places in the Constitution that indicate that the legislature uh, adopts some legislation, and that must be presented to the executive, and the executive must approve it. And this is where the executive is able to veto legislation presented by Congress. Well, you kind of have the reverse situation here where the executive takes an action and the legislature has an opportunity to veto what the executive did. And the majority in Chadha said, that's a real problem. That's unconstitutional. The only veto, presentment and veto power is for the legislature to present to the executive. There's no presentment and veto power for the executive to present and the legislature to veto what the executive has done. The other piece of this is the bicameralism requirement. So the, the Constitution specifies that for legislation to be adopted, the House and the Senate, both chambers, uh, vote on it and agree on it, and then present it to the executive, and then the executive approves it or, or vetoes it. So in this instance, the statute allowed either body, the House or the Senate, to adopt a resolution legislatively vetoing what the executive did. And in fact, factually, in Chadha's case, it was only a House resolution. So the majority says this is a problem, um, a, a, a number of structural problems with this statute. Nice little nugget from the majority opinion. The hydraulic pressure inherent within each of the separate branches to exceed the outer limits of its power, even to accomplish desirable objectives, must be resisted. So a very strong sense here that yeah, there's a lot of t a lot of tension, uh, and when each branch has ha branch has a certain responsibility, a lot of uh, kind of temptation to over overstep the constitutional bounds, but that those constitutional bounds have to be maintained. Justice Powell writes a, a concurrence, and um, what Justice Powell says is, yes, I agree with the result, but I'm really concerned with the reasoning because of the importance and breadth of the administrative state and the widespread use of legislative veto provisions in legislation that sets up administrative bodies to allow Congress to continue to have some check or control over this administrative operation. And so Powell says, I don't want to touch this in terms of the legislative veto issue. What I want to do is say, it's really an uh, Article 2 versus Article 3 issue. So the judicial function in Article 3 is to decide cases and controversies. Congress, the legislature, is not supposed to adjudicate individual cases. And so here, Justice Powell says, well, effectively what Congress did was they took Chadha's individual case, what the House did, is took Chadha's individual case and adjudicated it. And, and that shouldn't happen. So Powell says, I would reach the same result, but I would do it under the judicial function issue so that I don't have to touch the whole administrative state. Now, Justice White goes even further and says, and dissents, and says, this is really fundamentally important. There's many, many laws out there that, because of the way the administrative state functions, have legislative vetoes. And he mentions a number of them, but he does specifically mention among them the War Powers Act. And, and this is one reason why, a key reason why this case is important to us for, for our course right, right now, because he says, look, a number of statutes, including the War Powers re Resolution, have legislative vetoes. And if the reasoning in Chadha is applied to those statutes, those st statutes would be held unconstitutional as, unconstitutional as well. And uh, White thinks this is a bad idea because of the breadth of the administrative state. So given the majority's reasoning in Chadha, given what White says in his dissent, most scholars believe that if challenged, the War Powers Act uh, probably would be held unconstitutional, that the ability of Congress to effectively veto 
a, an executive decision to commit military troops under the executive's um, authority as commander in chief in the Constitution would be a legislative veto that would violate Chadha. So, so very much in doubt whether the War Powers Act would even be effective. So Justice White also has a nice little quote where he, he talks about actually the um, convenience factor, while it can't fundamentally override the constitutional separation of powers, is really important, and we have to look at the reality of the administrative state. White, however, doesn't win the day in this particular case. So the other case I asked you to look at is Campbell v. v. Clinton, and this is a uh, direct challenge to a president's action under the War Powers Act uh, that is decided in the D.C. Circuit, not by the Supreme Court. So factual background, uh, you have in 1999, the U.S. committing armed forces under NATO uh, to deliver airstrikes, including uh, using U.S. fighter jets and cruise missiles in a conflict in Yugoslavia. President Clinton re uh, makes a report to Congress about this activity, so notice that it's not, the report is not stated as being pursuant to the War Powers Resolution, but consistent with what I mentioned before, it says consistent with the War Powers Resolution. So it's this uh, effort to try and suggest you're making a report, but you're not formally trig triggering the War Powers Resolution. So after the president makes this report, there is a vote in the House. Now, there's a number of, of conservative members of the House who feel that this commitment of, of military power in Yugoslavia is, a, is an overextension of U.S. military power abroad and are, are displeased with this use of military power. So the first thing that happens is, is there's a uh, vote on a declaration of war, which I think if you see the result, undoubtedly this is a political move designed to kind of put something on the record that Congress is not prepared to declare war, and that uh, gets voted down. There is then a resolution to specifically authorize the president's airstrikes, and that fails to pass. And you'll notice that it's the closest of, of possible margins by which it does not fail to pass. Then there is a resolution put forward to require the president to cease the operation. That also does not pass, and as you can see, it, it fails to pass by a, a relatively wide margin. Then there is a resolution to fund the operation, and that passes. So some interesting kind of political dynamics, somewhat ambiguous result of what uh, the House, in fact, thinks about uh, the adventure in the NATO adventure in Yugoslavia. So the operation in Yugoslavia continues for 79 days, which of course uh, goes beyond the 60-day period in the War Powers Resolution. Prior to the termination of the conflict, a, a group of 31 congressmen who opposed the action in Yugoslavia sue for a declaratory judgment, uh, and they want a declaratory judgment that the president's actions violate the War Powers Resolution and also violate the, con the, the constitutional separation of powers. So this is the case that goes up to the D.C. Circuit. So note, you know, the case is filed before the hostilities cease, but in the interim, as the case is pending, the hostilities have ceased. So very interesting opinion because you end up with a three-panel appellate panel, a three-judge appellate panel, and there's a majority, but then there are also three separate concurrences. So the majority opinion is that the president's action did not violate the War Powers Resolution or the Constitution primarily because Congress always remained free to ad adopt an, a resolution that would have required the president to end the operation. But Congress didn't, never adopted that kind of resolution. And effectively, uh, the majority saw the case as individual congressmen who couldn't win politically in the legislative chamber trying to get the courts to make the legislature do what they wanted. And the majority says that's not how it works, right? That you, 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 in the legislative ch chamber, you try to persuade, and if you don't, you know, then you're on the losing side. So that way of setting it up 
the majority says, avoids a constitutional issues. We don't even have to get there. Now, the concurrences are really interesting. So Judge Silberman says, the claims are not justiciable because the courts can't even decide whether or not a particular military operation is an act of war that would invoke the powers and limitations of Congress and the president under the war powers in the Constitution. And he also says the courts can't determine whether a military action is the kind of trigger that would have to trigger even trigger reporting requirements under the War Powers Act. Judge Silverman says those kinds of decisions are uh, really left to the commanders on the ground, to the president. So Judge Silverman says courts just aren't competent to make those kinds of determinations. Now Judge Randolph says, well, I want to be a little more um, technical about what the issue was with respect to standing. So he says um, the standing question, whether these individual legislators have standing, and he talks about a body of, of case law that I, 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 I kind of cut out of the opinion. There's a lot of discussion, but basically what it says is this. No, a, an individual legislator can't come to the court and say, you know, I lost in the legislature. I want you to overturn that result. That's just the way voting works. But a legislator could come to the court and say, my vote didn't even count. It was effectively nullified. And there are, there are cases that involve, you know, procedural defects or, or unlawful procedural maneuvers to prevent certain legislators from having a vote or having a voice. So if it were a nullification question, Randolph says, we could hear it. But here he says it's, it's not a nullification question. Every uh, representative had an opportunity to be heard and to vote. Uh, and further, Randolph said, the whole issue is moot. Because even though the declaratory judgment action was brought before the hostilities ceased, the hostilities have since ceased. Uh, now, again, there's a kind of body of, of case law that I, that, I, that I cut out. You don't need to worry about it too much. But in this question of ripeness or mootness of, of a claim and a declaratory judgment action, you know, you can't just go to court for an advisory opinion. You have to have a, an actual case or controversy. You can sometimes go to court for a declaratory judgment before the controversy kind of actually hits the fan, so to speak, so long as it's imminent. If the controversy ends and, and there's no further issue about uh, a remedy, like a monetary remedy or something like that, then there's no more controversy and the case might be moot. If the controversy ends, but there's a good chance that the same controversy might flare up and repeat itself imminently, then it may not be moot. So here, Judge Randolph says, there is no possibility of repetition of this conflict. It's over. It was very unique conflict. It's not going to, this same conflict isn't going to flare up again. If there's some other conflict and this similar issue arises, maybe it wouldn't be moot. You know, maybe there'd then be an, an issue to be decided by a court. But this conflict, it's done. All right, so then you have Judge Tattel. And Judge Tattel says, Okay, I agree. There's no standing for the individual congressman. But if there had been standing, he says, the issue, in fact, would have been justici justiciable. Judge Tattel says courts regularly decide factual questions and interpretive questions under the Constitution and under statutes where the language of the Constitution or the language of the statute is vague. In fact, this is what courts do. Uh, and so Judge Sattel says, we could have made determinations about whether this constituted war. We could have made determinations about um, whether these were the kinds of host hostilities that would trigger the war powers resolution. But we're not going to do it here because the, the claim is not justiciable because the, uh, or because the Congress people don't have individual standing. Now, how does this all relate to the subject matter of our course? And we'll, we'll talk about this more when we meet in person in class. But if these issues of the separation of powers and the war powers and the relation of Congress and the president and the reporting relationships are interpretively difficult and legally difficult in 
the kind of ordinary kinetic world where you have jet fighters and cruise missiles flying over Yugoslavia, uh, how much more difficult is it in cyberspace? So, for example, we looked at the Stuxnet virus. I showed you a video that included discussion of the Stuxnet virus. Uh, and so let's assume that the U.S. was involved in that, as most experts think, and that that was an operation conducted by U.S. military slash intelligence agencies. Is that an act of hostilities which has to be reported to Congress? Is that an exercise of the executive's war power? What role does Congress have, if any, in the oversight of that? Let's take as another example uh, what everyone assumes to be true, that since we are being uh, regularly hacked and attacked by nation states such as China, that we're hacking back. Um, you know, one of the ways you can respond to a cyber attack is a hack back. And if, you, and if you're good enough to figure out where that hack is coming from, you might send your own denial of service attack or other things back to try and disable the hackers who are hacking you. Is that something that triggers the war powers? Does it trigger the war powers resolution? Is it an exercise of the executive's war power? Is it something else? Take as another example, the launching of preemptive offensive cyber operations. Another thing which we are almost certainly presently engaged and which is part of um, existing national defense military doctrine. So you've got some group of, let's say, organized crime group who is hacking and stealing trade secrets of major U.S. corporations. You have a nation state, again, like China, that's doing things like that. Uh, and we're identifying where they are and we're putting uh, devices, malware on their systems so that we can monitor what they're doing. Is that an act of war? Is that something that triggers the war powers resolution? How does the is there any role for the judiciary to oversee any of those kinds of decisions? And if so, when? I think the short answer, at least in my view, is that there probably needs to be some greater uh, legislative and regulatory clarity about how this all operates, and at least some uh, greater sense of reporting and, and accountability among the branches about how these kinds of things are happening or can happen. I'm not sure what exactly the right solution to that is, but that's the kind of thing that we'll talk about when we meet in person next week.